Today is Sister Day, another occasion for Christian faithful around the world to pause and remind themselves of the significance of the self-sacrifice made by Jesus Christ more than 2,000 years ago for the sake of mankind. For many, this day has become nothing more than an annual ritual which offers them the opportunity to wine and dine and revel in all manners of earthly pleasures. For others, though, it continues to be a widow for sober reflection regarding what their relationship with God should be at every time and in all situations. In the largely polarized world of today, when hunger, worlds, and other forms of civil strife have taken center stage, what must Christians be seen to be doing in order to validate their faith and vocation? And how can religion be explored to restore peace to the world? To have a discussion, we are now being joined by Pastor Wali Adifarasin, who is a senior pastor and general overseer of Guiding Light Assembly. Good morning, Pastor Adifarasin. Good and happy morning. Easter to you. Good morning, Steve. Good morning. And the same, the same to you. All right. Good to have you on the show. It's another Easter Sunday. Uh, and of course, yeah. Christian faithful uh, all over the world are celebrating. Uh, I'm not so sure if we are celebrating in Nigeria. Uh, I know that every time uh, the message of Easter is not lost on anybody. But for today and for this period that um, everywhere seems to be uncertain, and politically charged. What message do you think that Nigerians will be uh, eager to, to listen to today? Well, the key message of Easter Sunday is that Christ died, he was buried, but death could not keep him, death could not hold him, he rose again from the dead. If Christ rose again from the dead, then surely Nigeria can rise up again. I think that's the first message. The second message of Easter is what propelled Jesus Christ to do what he did. It was his love. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that we could be saved. Uh, and, 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 and the Bible also teaches us that we should love our brethren, our brothers and sisters, love one another as Christ has loved us. Um, if we can share this message of love, across our nation and if we can share the message of hope that we can arise again no matter how badly we have sunk that this message should bring cheer to the christian and to all nigerians right you know as steve has mentioned we just discussed uh, you know bring back our girls and only last week we had you know uh, the attacks in play two and then we had the kaduna train attack I'd like for you to shed some light on how Easter and the significance of Easter can, you know, change that type of narrative and bring peace back into our hearts at this point of our nationhood. Um, thank you, OJ. Happy Easter to you, too. Um, it, it's, it's really about living the life of Christ. Um, if those of us who are Christians lived a Christian life, a life that is worthy of emulation, we would be setting an example for those who commit these dastardly acts. Um, there's no question that this is uh, the work of evil, um, kidnapping young girls, keeping them for years. This, this is evil. And um, light uh, always dispels darkness. If we let our light shine before men, God himself will, 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 will change the narrative. I hope that answers your question, Oji. Well, it does a bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, team. Um, you know, in, in still this theme of what's currently going on in Nigeria this Easter period, uh, of course, when there's life, there's hope. But for a lot of people, they are experiencing the worsening uh, security situation when we look at what's happening in Plateau State, for example, what happened along that Kaduna Abuja uh, railway. There are lots of examples of people feeling unsafe. And in the spirit of Easter, where we talk about renewal and rebirth and restoration, what do you think people can do, regardless of religion, to come closer to a belief that there is a better life on the other side of what's happening here? Well, first and foremost, um, it's not only our security. Let, let's face it. Um, 
uh, we, we, we have a worsening security situation. Our economy is getting worse. Healthcare delivery is getting worse. Education system is breaking, it's collapsing. So, so things seem to be collapsing around us. And I think we've reached the point where we just have to turn to, to God um, to, to direct us and help us out of this situation. And so, as I, as I said, as I said earlier, um, we need to draw closer to God as a people. Uh, and, and, and there's a scripture that says, if my people um, who are called by my name will turn away from their wickedness, um, he will heal the, our land. Um, so it's, it's really a question of making that decision. And it's a choice, um, making that decision to draw closer to God. Because as we draw closer to him, he draws closer to us. And I mean, some of the things God can do for us is he can show us that which is to come. He can open our eyes to see the things that are not normally uh, 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 visible to, to, to the natural man. Uh, and he can direct our steps, tell us what to do um, as we draw closer to him. So I think that ultimately it's a relationship, a deepening relationship with God that will make the difference. Yeah, but uh, Pastor, how does this uh, satisfy um, a hungry Lord? You know, people who are struggling, people uh, who believe that they have been lied to consistently. And by being lied to, I'm not just uh, talking about people who rule them uh, uh, in terms of politics. I'm also talking in terms of people who are meant to shepherd them. These days, uh, we have, um, you know, uh, uh, shepherds in many assemblies um, relocating abroad, you know, to North America, to Europe. Uh, we have had men of God, uh, and including your own brother, you know, um, saying that uh, 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 people should have plan B. And plan B means that, you know, uh, be ready to elope um, as soon as uh, uh, things get worse. Uh, I'm not so sure, and a lot of people will think that these are not very comforting uh, words uh, 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 that should put their minds at rest. So I asked you again. Uh, what do you say to people who are constantly hearing uh, scary messages like this? And they are saying that their pastors uh, have the means and the opportunity, you know, to, to run away. Uh, what should they do? Um, as you know, there is really hardly anything that can happen that you will have 10, 5, 10 percent of Nigerians at any time, you know, being able to um, leave. What, therefore, should be the right message? And how do you think those that are like babies uh, in Christ can deal with these challenging times? I, I, I think, Steve, that we, we need to embrace God. That, that's the first thing, because unless you have God in you, you cannot demonstrate his characteristics. So that's the first thing. Um, secondly, it took a long time for Nigeria to get as bad as it is. I, I, I am about to turn 70 by the grace of God. I, I've been around before independence came. And um, so, so I, I've seen a different Nigeria. I saw a Nigeria that, that where things worked. We might not have been as developed as we are now. So it's taken a long time to get here. It's going to take a long time to get out of this. But if we have, if we have men and women not just in government, but as you said, in, in the ministry of the gospel, in, 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 in the, the mosque, in all religions, in all facets of life. If we have men and women that are committed first to Nigeria and secondly to doing the right thing, if we have men and women like that, gradually we will pull Nigeria out of the morass. It's, it's, it's sunk deep, um, it's going to take time. It's going, to, it's going to mean that all of us, and I hope it, it, it reaches all of us, the rich and the poor, tighten our belts and help one another. Um, you know, the poor need help. Um, there, there, there is fantastic wealth in this nation. There are people that are extremely wealthy, and next door, close by them, are people that are in abject poverty. There has to be a change of heart where people will begin to express the love of God to one another through their actions, not just by words. Um, that's what I can say, Steve, to, the, to that question. But, but, but you, don't, you don't think that as an individual that I should 
uh, begin to consider a plan B about this country? I am not. <laughs> Understood. I'm not considering a plan B for myself. I, I believe that we need to rescue our country. All right, Pastor Wale, you are a televangelist and you co-host a, a weekly program, Heart of the Matter. For those of us who don't know what you discuss on your program, I'd like to know, um, you know, how your program has shaped um, some, you know, narrative. Talk to us about what you talk about during your um, Heart, of the Pro Heart of the Matter sessions. That's, that's quite a bit of research you've done. I, I've not, I've not uh, uh, presented that program for some time. What, what I did was allowed some of the younger people to, to begin to present the program. Let me tell you what we did, uh, what we do. We um, highlight things that people are doing. Um, I, I've talked to so many people. One, one person was, had a, started an NGO that dealt with examination malpractice. And so they made themselves available to check exam malpractice. Another person was taking mentally um, uh, affected people off the streets and getting them rehabilitated or getting them treated. Um, so there, there's a multitude of things, people that deal with uh, sicknesses, uh, uh, chronic diseases. So we brought them onto the program. We aired what they do and gave them an opportunity to sub get support for what they do. That's essentially what the heart of the matter was. That the heart of the matter is Christianity in action, not Christianity by speech alone. Mm. Well, if we could talk about how faith and politics intersect. I mean, it's no secret that you have a you have a, 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 a relationship of some sort with uh, Professor Yemi Osibajo, who is, of course, the vice president of this country and who this week declared his intention to run for president. When it comes to the church in general terms, in order for someone to seek a political endorsement from uh, a house of faith, serve some sort of social capital, most especially within election season. Is it your intention to align with Vice President uh, Yemi Osibajo in his journey to become president? Um, Professor Yemi Osibajo has been a long-term friend. I've known him uh, for many, many years. And what brought us together was, in fact, how, how can we contribute to getting our country out of its present state. And this was many years ago, so this has been a long time in the offing. Um, now, I believe that the role of the church, uh, and this is, this is built based on scripture, is to be involved in every facet of human endeavor. Uh, Christians should go into politics, Christians should go into healthcare, education, and do the best, bring God's kingdom to bear in those places. So yes, I, I, I believe that Christians should be engaged in politics. I believe that the time came when people viewed politics as a dirty game and a lot of good people pulled out of it. It's time to get back into politics. In terms of endorsements, uh, let me be very clear. I, I cannot, as a pastor who pastors people who belong to different political parties uh, make an endorsement. But I assure you that I will have, I have my PVC. I encourage everybody else to get theirs and I will be voting on the day for the candidate of my choice. All right, I, I like that, Pastor Adifarasin. Uh, that at least um, gives some ray of hope that you think uh, that the elections will hold uh, all things being equal. Uh, in 2023, but I, I wouldn't want to put you on the spot as Adefemi did. Uh, what I would like you to expand on uh, is the precisely what you have said that Christians should go into politics. Uh, we are now seeing churches, um, you know, um, having offices, directorates, uh, you know, for uh, those who may want to run for offices. But my question to you is, what sort of um, changes, what sort of positive changes do you think 
um, not just Christians, but men of God, men of faith, can bring uh, to bear if they are elected. Uh, bearing in mind that you know that at the time, uh, we have had Pastor Chris Okote, you know, who ran to be president, uh, claiming that uh, God sent him. Uh, we have had Pastor Tunde Bakari, uh, you know, who also ran with, you know, the incumbent president by that time that they lost. We have your friend, uh, Professor Yemi Oshibaju, as the vice president. He's been there for almost seven years. A lot of Nigerians will say, what has changed? What has his Christianity or his pastoral toga, you know, brought to bear? So I'm asking, especially now that uh, Pastor Tony Bakari himself again is saying that the God has told him that he will be number 16. Number 16 being that the person who will succeed uh, President Buhari. I'm saying that what sort of faith do you think that uh, Christian should have in men of faith coming on board to be their rulers? Uh, let, let me first start by saying that when I say Christians should go into politics, I am not speaking about men of God per se. Anybody who is a Christian. Now the question is, who is a Christian? Um, and, and that is a question that we need to ask ourselves. Am I, am I demonstrating the, the attributes of Christ? Now I'll tell you what I am doing beyond standing behind the pulpit and, and, and preaching. I was on uh, the morning show um, uh, some, a couple of months ago, and uh, Rufai Hosseini asked me a very pertinent question. He asked me, um, how come with so many churches, Nigeria is still in the mess that it is? And he quoted a scripture, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Uh, and I answered the question, but it set me doing a lot of thinking. And I researched into that scripture. The word righteousness in that scripture means developing a culture of doing the right thing. And um, I, I took that to my church and I said, look, we need to begin to teach Nigerians how to build a culture of doing the right thing. Because it doesn't matter what political solutions, economic solutions we, uh, uh, we uh, pr prefer, um, nothing, nothing will change as long as Nigerians have uh, developed a culture of doing the wrong thing, um, you know, this, this is, we drive the wrong way down the road, we don't stop at red lights. And so we've started an organization that is trying to build awareness of doing the right thing, encouraging those who do, shaming those who don't, and so on and so forth. So I can talk about what I'm doing. As to, as to men of God who have gone into politics, that's between them and God. I can't comment on what they, what, what they say that God told them because I wasn't there with them. Um, so that, that's as much as I can say on that question, uh, Steve. <laughs> now, what would you say to those who um, accuse Nigerians of being too religious and being carried away by religion? Well, I would say this, I am not religious. I am not religious. And to be honest with you, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is about a relationship. Um, and it's, it's, you know, any relationship needs to be nurtured. Any relationship needs to be, to, be, to be fed. You can't, you need communication. And so we need to spend time with God if we're going to develop our relationship with him. Um, and I, I, I prefer not to come out and say, God told me this, because at the end of the day, um, if God told me, he will, it will be borne out um, with, the, with the facts. Uh, it will be borne out with what happens. Um, so yes, we, we, many say we are religious, we're very religious. I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's about that relationship that we have with God. And the deeper your relationship with God is, the better a person you will be. And, and you know what God does is he affects you in your life first before he uses you or before he can use you to affect other people's lives. Pastor, you're well aware that Nigeria has a huge problem when it comes to the population of this country who live in poverty. And when we look at religious scripture, or if we look at Christianity, for example, can you offer any guidance in terms of how someone can 
live that way. Perhaps if you shared the story of Job, is it Job? Who, who, from my understanding, and like I said, <laughs> it, it can be, it can be, a, yes, who endured, it, thank you, that's where I'm, that's where I'm going, who endured a lot of loss from a place of abundance, went to a place of loss and still didn't really lose his, he, in, eventually, I believe he called on God for restoration and for help. Can people in Nigeria, regardless of religion, draw any parallels to the current poverty they're facing and the stories being told in the Bible, like the story of Job? The story of Job is, is a very interesting one. And if you read the story of Job right through, you'll find that his latter end was far better than his former end. He had to, he had to persist. Um, and one of the things about Job is that um, he, he trusted God. In spite of what he was going through, he trusted God. Now, Paul said, I have learned both to abase and to abound. You, you, you see, the, the primary object of a man coming into this world is not to make wealth. Um, I, I have not seen anybody who's been able to take not even a dime out of this world when they die. And everyone that is in this world will one day die. Um, so, so we need to put things in perspective. Uh, poverty, the poverty in our nation is, is really a, uh, painful and we need to do a lot more to alleviate poverty. Um, and, and not everything that we, we need to do is direct. There are many indirect ways that we can alleviate poverty. Teach the man how to catch fish rather than give him a fish when he, he's hungry. Teach him how to catch fish. Education is very important. We need to find ways of educating our people. Now, some people have religious barriers that are preventing them from being able to receive an education. We need to help break those down and, and, and uh, accentuate the importance of education. We need to take care of health. Um, there needs to be much better primary health care so that people are healthy and can work. So there's so much to be done. Now, the, the beautiful thing about this is that we have multifaceted problems, therefore there are multifaceted solutions. And not everybody is going to be doing the same thing. And whatever God has given you to do um, is for you to do. Don't criticize what somebody else is doing because they're doing what they uh, 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 have been motivated to do. Uh, so yes, the answer is that we all have to put all hands on deck uh, so that we can help solve our national crisis. Nigeria is a country of huge potential. But it, it makes me feel, it, it angers me to hear that we produce oil and up to 95% of it is lost or stolen. This, this is sad. It means that, that we're just stealing this country blind and it has to stop, it cannot continue. As a matter of fact, despite all the, all the talk about breaking up, this, if we continue on this trajectory, it will just happen. We'll just fail as a state. Uh, Adifemi, I hope that you have, you have goes pastor, to some you. of the, your question. Uh, all right, Pastor. Um, you, you know we were once described as the happiest people on earth. Um, and then before the extremists descended on us in some parts of the country, uh, we were also described as being very... Uh, religiously tolerant, of course, being a secular, if you like, uh, a multi-religious uh, country. Um, but then I apologize if I have to draw you slightly back into, uh, you know, uh, narratives of politics. Uh, but it looks to me like uh, that has been stretched now, uh, given that uh, people, some people think that it shouldn't matter uh, the sort of balance, the sort of um, arrangements towards justice, politically speaking, that we have always had. Uh, in other words, some people would say that um, a Muslim Muslim ticket shouldn't be a problem. Uh, it's hard. Hardly ever will you hear of a Christian Christian ticket because you know you can't even think about it. Uh, but then some people are saying that you know we have had it before when M K Abiola, you know, and. Uh, uh, is running mate, uh, you know, both Muslims. These days, um, given the sensitivity around the subject and the things that we have unfortunately had to go through, uh, what would be your message to people of faith? 
uh, if it turns out that we may at some point be dealing with the likelihood of a, of a Muslim Muslim ticket and the possibility of retaining power in the North after eight years of a Northern Muslim at the helms of affairs. You know, in an ideal world, meritocracy is the answer. And I, I really don't understand why so many people are jostling for the office of president. It, it must be the most difficult office in the whole world because of the problems that, the, that would face a president coming in in 2023. So in an ideal world, meritocracy, let the best man, the best person for the job get the job. That would be the ideal. But in a nation that is that has so much diversity and people are beginning to feel that they are being marginalized and so on and so forth. It is important. It is very important that we allow um, there to be some rotation in, in the distribution of offices, at, at least until we can build trust in, in a meritocracy uh, uh, system. So. Um, the, the, the honest truth is my own personal view is that when you have a Muslim president, it's only fair that you have a Christian vice president and vice versa. Uh, so that's where I stand on the subject. I believe that at the bottom of any uh, 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 faith must be truth and justice. That's the foundation of Christianity, truth and justice, equality. Uh, these are very important um, the rule of law, and uh, we've, we've had a few years of, of uh, imbalance, so we need to redress it. I wanted to take you back to your answer, uh, Defemi's uh, question. Um, did, did you um, say that at this time in our nation, with, with all the insecurity and poverty, pe people that are calling for a separate nation may succeed? Did you say that? Uh, no, I didn't say that. Okay. What, what, let me be very clear, yeah. because I don't want to be uh, accused of, of, of a treas treasonable felony. Mm -hmm. No, what, what I said is that if we allow the nation to continue to deteriorate this way, we won't even have people to have people calling for separation. It will just happen naturally because things get out of order. Can you imagine a situation if warlords, and we're not far from that, if warlords dominated uh, different communities and began to collect their own taxes? It, it won't be long before there's no more Nigeria. And that's what, that's what I'm saying. I, I'm, not, I'm not supporting a breakup. I do believe that we do need to have a devolution of power from the center to the, to the regions or the states or whatever it is. I do believe that we started life as a federation. We have become more of a unitary system right now. And these things need to be dealt with. So that's, that's my stand, OG. I hope that clarifies my position. Absolutely. I wanted to clarify that because people... I think we put the people, under a lot yes. of pressure. <laughs> 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 take that out of context. I wanted you to put that in context. But, but, but past, yeah, yeah, OG, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but, but before we let you go, Pastor, um, I, I just thought that I should ask you this. Uh, when Christ said that uh, we should give unto Caesar uh, what was Caesar's, I, I, I thought that he was speaking in terms of taxes. Um, and I'd like to ask you, um, uh, you know, the jury is still out on, on what is proper. Should churches pay taxes or not? What, what, where do you stand? Well, I'm, I'm very clear on this. Um, Churches are registered as, as entities under the Part C of the uh, um, CAC, uh, uh, not for profit. Um, what you tax is profit. What you tax is a, an individual's income or, or a corporation's profit. Churches don't make profits. Invariably, they live on donations from people who have already paid tax on their income. Now, if a church engages in a business, maybe it runs a bookstore, or maybe it has a school, and that is charging fees and is making a profit, then that profit should quite reasonably be taxed. But certainly the church can, should not be taxed. And that's, that's, I'm very clear on that. Um, if you change the way in which taxes operate, then fair enough. Uh, but we're not, we're dealing... I, I think, uh, Steve, this question arises because of 
the ostentatious lives yes. that some men of God live. And, uh, and also because of the fact that um, the authorities are not doing what they should do. If the authorities do what they should do and make sure that all, all organizations, religious organizations, um, have o produce audited, externally audited accounts, then these matters won't really arise. Um, because people will be able to look at the books and, and see where it is coming from and where it is going. Um, so, yeah, that's my position. It's, it's, it's wrong to ch tax churches or oh. any other religious organization or any not-for-profit, for that matter. All right. Well, thank all you for right. that clarity. Uh, Pastor Wally, we do want to say thank you for joining thank us you. this morning. Wish you all a happy Easter. It's been a very interesting conversation. Thank yes. you very much. And to wish him a happy 70th birthday in advance. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you look great for 70. Yes. Congratulations, Congratulations, Pastor. Congrats. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful Easter yourselves. God thank bless you. you. you too.